bombs can get through the toughest defenses. But throughout history, strategies for stopping the bombers themselves got more complex. Fighters, radar, and ground missiles stood in the way. Sometimes the bomber had to fight its way into enemy territory. It was not uncommon to have a hundred holes through the bottom of your airplane. Bombers are battle winners. Left unchallenged, they can destroy men, machines, and morale. The carnage they cause makes them a prime target for enemy forces, anti-aircraft guns, missiles, enemy fighters. Being in a bomber is no easy ride. Faced by this kind of danger, there are two choices, flight or fight. This is a B-17 that had 12 or more 50 caliber machine guns that are really deadly. The big breakthrough was the marriage of heavy machine guns with rotating gun positions. The first 360 degree turrets were developed in 1933. 50 cal machine guns are the most lethal on the planet. A B-17 carried 9,000 rounds, and a direct hit will pierce almost anything, including the engine block of a Messerschmitt fighter. A new breed of heavily armed bomber was born. Beasts of the air like the B-24 Liberator, the British Avro Lancaster, and the classic B-17. B-17G had uh, 13 50 caliber machine guns on it. This forward one we call the chin turret. It was actually run by the bombardier. This would be his sight here, which is coupled into the turret. So whichever way you turn the turret, up, down, left, or right, the sight's going to follow you. Um, you also have uh, the, your two cheat guns. You get your left one here, and then your right one's over here. So there, this is actually what's protecting the front of the ship. We have two waist gunners. You can actually turn them however you need to to go to, in order to shoot the fighter. You just gotta be careful you don't shoot your wing off because they flew such a tight formation. Um, sometimes you'd have one of your airplanes right next to you and just in the heat of battle, you know, you'd zip a couple bullets across to them. So you gotta pay attention to what they were doing. The most technologically advanced of all the gun positions was the ball turret. Now this is how he's sitting. You see, you got the stirrups and hand control. Like I said, head's looking right through the sight there. Built by the Sperry Corporation of Arizona, the complex combination of electrics and hydraulics defended the vulnerable underbelly of the B-24 and B-17. But the most frightening and exposed position on heavy bombers like the B-17 and Lancaster was the tail gun. Not much protection back here. He had one piece of armor that was in front of him, and that was it. So this was one of the first positions they tried to take out because once they do that, they've got open rain on the entire back side of the airplane. Exposed to enemy fighters and the elements. Tail gunners were hanging it out. Well, I was what they called uh, tail end Charlie, which was a rear gunner. And my role was to protect the rear of the aircraft. Even though you had an oxygen mask on, your exhaling would create icicles to form down below your chin, which you had to break off from time to time to enable you to use your uh, intercom. And there was twice as many rear gunners lost during the Second World War than any other position on the aeroplane because they were so vulnerable. The life expectancy of a rear gunner was only four trips, four, four ops, and that was it. Despite all the Allied bombers' heavy guns, the fight was unequal. German Messerschmitt fighters usually came out on top. Bomber squads tried to even up the odds by sticking together. 54 B-17s flew in four groups of 18 planes, an awesome formation a mile wide and a half a mile deep. Pack mentality. Safety in numbers became the doctrine from the moment that the U.S. entered the European Air War in 1942. Anyone separated from the herd would be picked off by predatory fighters. The closer the formation was, the more 
resistance you were to the fighters, you could get more firepower compacted on the fighters uh, if you had a good close formation. If they broke up the formation and you were on your own loose, uh, you were almost a dead duck. Thousands of B-17s did get bounced. Many went to the ground in fireballs. But plenty also survived. Like Ali in the jungle, it could absorb punch after punch and still come out of its corner fighting. It was not uncommon to have a hundred holes through the bottom of the airplane. She wasn't built for comfort, she was built to fight. They could take, take a brutal beating, take a lot to knock her out of the air. Some came back with part of the tail wing gone, big holes in them all over the place. She was the queen. There's no, no bomber that was as good as this one. But defending a slow, heavy airframe packed with bombs was always a struggle. The 8th Air Force lost 4,000 B-17s to the Luftwaffe. For the Air Force, it was too much to take. The bombers needed a hand. It becomes rapidly apparent in the Second World War that even though the B-17 is bristling with machine guns all over it, it still needs an escort to help it get to its target. In the early years of the war, fighters lacked the range to escort the bombers over hostile territory. That changed when the P-51 Mustang was fitted with the Rolls-Royce Merlin engine and extra fuel tanks. The P-51 could fly 2,000 miles. That's Atlanta to Los Angeles without refueling. The most important development for the bomber was actually a fighter. The B-17s and B-24s could be escorted all the way to their targets in eastern Germany by one single-engine fighter type, the P-51 Mustang. The long-range fighters, particularly the P-51 Mustang, could tangle with the German fighter pilots and keep them away from the bomber formations. When the Mustang came along and everything, we were able to have that tiny little friend, you know, escort us all the way. She could fly clear into Berlin, clear into Dresden. We called them little buddies, and, and you'd give them guys anything they wanted. The Mustang was seen as a war winner, and escorted bombers spelled the end for Germany.